are a pastor. If that's what God has called you to do, that's what you are. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You are a pastor. You must conduct yourself as such. You must carry yourself as such. You must walk out what God has asked you to do in that office. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to another great pastoring essentials. I'm so great, so glad and grateful that you chose to join us for this month's edition. God's going to show us some wonderful things from the Word of God. And uh, so let's pray and we'll get right into today's lesson. Father, we thank you. We glorify you. We magnify you for all that you're doing in your church, Lord all that you're doing in the United States, all that you're doing around the world. Father, as your people, we just refuse to look at uh, the turmoil, the things that are going on. Father, we choose to look past that and know that your plan for our nation, your plan for our churches, your plan for our ministries, they are great and they are without match and that you will surely do all that you've called us to do and you will back up what you've asked of us. And Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to uh, take this session today and uh, this month and we're going to look at the building blocks of success. Now, I've heard this I've been doing this long enough to have heard over and over people's, different people's definition of success. And I've heard statements regarding numbers. I've heard statements regarding big churches, small churches. Uh, I've even made some of those statements. Uh, for instance, a statement that is very uh, prevalent in many uh, ministries and, and many ministers' vocabulary is simply this. They'll say, well, if numbers were not important to God, God would not have written a book called Numbers. Well, it's true that, that numbers are not inconsequential. God, God doesn't care if you have a big church. Uh, numbers are uh, important to Him, but they are not the important thing. Uh, now, right on the other hand, on the other, on the other side of that is the argument that, uh, you know, if you have a small church, it's better. If you have a growing church, it's better. Well, uh, both of those arguments uh, are not untrue in their core, meaning that if you have a, a growing church where the Spirit of God is present, and uh, people are getting touched, people are getting healed, lives are being changed, people are being born again, you're fulfilling the call of God for your life, then that's fine. Uh, go with that. That's, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, but the flip side of that also is that that doesn't mean that just having a growing church is the perfect will of God for everybody and everybody should just strive to have just a, a, a church that's growing, a small church, if that's what you want to call it. Just as you can't say just because a person has a, a huge number of people coming or a large number of people coming, that that is what proves that they're successful. What proves that I'm successful is that I'm accomplishing what God asked me to do. Now, that's where a lot of ministers and a lot of pastors have a, a difficulty, if you will, because just doing what God called you to do is at times not difficult in the sense of difficult to do, but difficult to just hold the course and know that that's what God told me to do, all right? This is what God told me to do, and this is what I'm going to stay with. Because there will always be other elements that are trying to pull you away from what God asked you to do and pull you into uh, their way of thinking and their way of doing. And it's fine 
to use things that work. It's fine to, to, to get involved with things that are fruitful. But at the end of the day, if you will, I've got to be doing what God called me to do. All right, which is pastoring the church that God gave me and doing what he told me to do in that body. All right, that's so important. The Apostle Paul said something in Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. And he said, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. And then he says this, I magnify my office. All right, in other words, I'm saying this to you because I'm magnifying my office. The Wiest translation says, I do my ministry honor. Listen, if you're doing what God told you to do, all right, where God told you to do it, the way God told you to do it, you have to magnify that. You have to honor that. There are times in a minister's life where you're the one that's giving honor to what God asked you to do. How do I give honor to that, Pastor? You give honor to that by staying with what God told you. Notice Paul said, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. All right? I magnify that office. I do my ministry honor by reminding you that this is who I am. I am the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, because this is a program specifically designed to help pastors, I believe that I'm speaking to pastors or people that, that have a call of God on your life. You've got to magnify that office. All right? Why? Because that is one of the central building blocks to success is that I make much of the office that God has called me to. I make much of the calling on my life. When I wrote the book, Local Church, The Hope of the World, I wrote that book for the main reason was because of my love for the local church. I think the local church is the change agent of God in the earth. I think that uh, the local church is literally the hope of the world because we are the 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 outpost that's ministering the word of God in our communities. We're the light in our community. But uh, in the foreword of that book, in the dedication, I said, I dedicate this book to every man or woman of God that's pastoring in the local church. And I said, I hope that through this book you will see the beauty and the dignity of what God's called you to do. You know, God has called you as a pastor to be a shepherd over his sheep. Now, you've got to understand something. God's sheep are his children. Now, I was always very selective about who I allowed to watch my children. I'm very selective about who I allow to watch my grandchildren. Why? They are precious to me. Now, if God has placed you in a position as a pastor... He has placed you there because he trusts you. He trusts you with his sheep. He trusts you with his people. And it doesn't matter what level you're pastoring on. And when I say level, I don't mean levels of importance. I mean whether you're pastoring uh, a senior pastor, pastoring the adults in the church, whether you're a youth pastor, pastoring the students, whether you're a children's pastor, pastoring the children. God has trusted you with that group of people, regardless of their age, and he's saying, I want you to pastor them. I want you to care for them. I want you to help them grow. If you're a children's pastor, you're taking that word of God and you're looking for creative ways to break it down and break it into bite-sized pieces where they can, they can uh, swallow that word and become uh, uh, believers that know how to work the word if you're uh, pastoring adults, you have the charge to watch over their souls, to feed them the word of God, and to see them grow into what God wants them to be. Now, you have to magnify your office. You have to make much of the office that God has called you to do. You have to honor the mantle on your own life. You have to honor that mantle 
All right? Now, that can involve a number of different things. The, the first thing that it involves is understanding that God himself has called you to do what you're doing. All right? You honor that mantle. This is not just an ability that I have. I don't just have the ability to stand before people and, and, and make a good talk. You know, I'll hear that from a lot of ministers today. You know, uh, well, in my talk today, this is what I'm going to say. I don't know that I ever get up in the pulpit and just have a talk. I have a message. I have a sermon. I have a lesson that I believe God gave me to give to the people. All right, see, that's part of, of honoring that anointing on my life. That's part of magnifying my office. I'm not just up here talking. I'm speaking for the Lord to his sheep. That's so important. It, it, may, be, it may be something that you need to speak on on a regular basis. For instance, we need to speak on marriage in our churches. But when do I speak on marriage? When I see marriage problems in my church? No. When I know that the Holy Spirit is dealing with me to minister along those lines. That's the word that God wants his people to have. You're not up there just making a talk. You're not up there just sharing information. You're not up there just sharing something because it's on the calendar and it's what you feel like you need to talk about. You're not talking about raising children in troubled times just because it's time to go back to school. You're not talking about uh, uh, being thankful because it's Thanksgiving season. You're not talking about the birth of Jesus Christ because it's Christmas season. You're talking about that because that's what the Holy Spirit is dealing with you to share with your people. Now, there's nothing wrong with ministering those messages in a seasonal time, but you want it to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. You're not up there just making a talk. I heard a, a minister who's a friend of mine Actually, I read in a book that he had written, and he said that he was at a church, and he said it was a very well-known church, very big church, and that uh, the pastor said to him, he said, uh, I don't even study for my messages anymore. He said, I just give my uh, assistant the topic, and they get on, online and get on the computer and get all my scriptures for me and put it all together and give me my outline. And they said, he said, there are times that they give me my outline as I'm going to the pulpit. And I just get up and minister from that. And my friend said that he thought to himself, he thinks he's really spiritual. And he's lost the anointing. He's lost the ability to do what God called him to do. See, he was just making a talk. Anybody can make an outline and get up and make a talk. Being led by the Holy Spirit and magnifying your office. The Lord said to me, he said, do you want wisdom to build this fellowship? Well, the answer obviously was yes. And then he gave me the following points. Number one, don't get in a hurry. If you want to have success, don't get in a hurry. Every season of your ministry is a learning time. Every season is a time of gaining knowledge for the next season. That's so important. If, if you will learn to exercise the fruit of patience, you'll learn what you need to learn in the season that you're in that will develop you and strengthen you for the season that you're moving into. Hallelujah. I'm telling you what, that was a word from the Holy Spirit for somebody. That was not just... A teaching, that was a prophetic word. And I'm telling you, if you'll be patient and exercise the fruit of patience, you'll learn what you need to learn in the season that you're in that will prepare you for the next season. Where you're at is not a stepping stone. It's not a rung on the ladder to something bigger. It's a, it's a stepping stone into the next season. Listen, where you're at. Not for you to go somewhere else. Hallelujah. So don't get in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. Longevity in many ministers' lives is cut short because they get in a hurry. All right? 
you settle it once and for all according to the word of God, I'm going to do what God's asked me to do. I'm not going to get in a hurry. I'm just going to walk it out. I'm going to honor the mantle on my life. I'm going to honor the anointing on my life and just stay with what God has asked me to do. Then secondly, he said, be diligent to do all the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Now, that's one of those things that very often people will look at it as uh, very elementary. Well, yeah, we got to do what the Holy Spirit asks us to do. Be very diligent to do all the Holy Spirit has asked you to do. Don't get in a hurry and be diligent to do all the Holy Spirit has asked you to do. Never be afraid to refuse to do something because the Holy Spirit has not led you to do it. Always be very quick to do everything the Holy Spirit asks you to do. All right? Know that the Holy Spirit is asking you to do it and then go after it. it it's very simple. All right? I, uh, one of our students that's graduating this Sunday from FBIMA for their ministry positioning paper, they interviewed me and they asked me, they said, what would you attribute the success in ministry that you have to this point? What would you attribute it to? And the first thing that I said was following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Following the leading of the Holy Spirit. There are things that we're doing today that I don't, I don't know necessarily even how we're doing it or how we're accomplishing it if it were not just that I knew I heard from the Holy Spirit and this is what he's asked of us and this is what we're going to do. So be very diligent to do all the Holy Spirit asks you to do. Oh, that's, that's, that's so simple, but yet it's so, it's so profound because there are a lot of people that are simply doing what the trend is. And you know, here's the thing. If the trend would make everybody so successful, then why is it that many pastors that are following the trend are not growing? Their churches aren't increasing. Because listen, I've, I've learned something. I believe, let me preface this with this. I believe that when you get in the pulpit, you should look as though you honor God. Now, uh, I'm not clothesline preaching. I'm, that's not what I'm doing. I believe you should look as if you honor God. When, when, when I watch uh, sports on TV, and I'm, I mainly watch college sports, uh, I'm a college basketball fan, Rock Chalk, Jayhawks. And, uh, but in any event, uh, you know, I watch a basketball game, and I see the head coaches, the assistant coaches in suits on the sidelines coaching a basketball game. What are they doing? They're honoring their office. They're the head coach. When you turn on the news, if you watch the news, and the news anchors are there in a suit. When you look at a politician, they're in a suit. Why? They're honoring the office that they have. I don't believe that a minister should lower his standard when he gets in the pulpit. Now that, that, that I, again, it's not closed line preaching and I'm not talking about any individual. I'm saying that there are ministers that they, they've went the way of the casual look. You know, they, they wear t-shirts. I, I saw one minister the other day, uh, his skinny jeans were so tight that, uh, you know, it wasn't any wonder he wasn't moving across the stage very much, you know, because he couldn't move, couldn't walk, and he and he had on a shirt that 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 looked wrinkled, you know, and 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 he was constantly pulling at it. You could tell he was uncomfortable. Uh, now now here's the point that I'm making. To me, it distracted away from what he was trying to say. Because there were skinny jeans on that were that were short, 
and had no socks on and loafers. I don't comprehend that. Now, understand why I'm saying this. He happens to pastor a large church. He happens to be a very good preacher. But there are ministers that will look at what he's done in the casual look, the laid back atmosphere, and they'll take that and put it in their church, put it to operation in their church, and nothing changes. Why? That's not the answer. If following the trend was the way to success, then all we would have to do is all of us become very trendy and we would be very successful. No, the key to success is following the Holy Spirit. Following what the Holy Spirit has to say to you. What did the Holy Spirit tell you to do? All right? Now, I know that there will be people that will, that will, and I've even had people say, you know, I kind of enjoy the casual atmosphere. And I, well, that's fine. Don't miss the point. The point is that's not what's going to make you successful. It's not getting in a hurry and following the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's key. Honoring the mantle that is on your life. Not taking that mantle and that anointing to places you shouldn't be. Not watching things that we shouldn't watch or listening to things that we shouldn't listen to. Why? It, it inhibits the anointing on my life. I have to be ready to pastor this church, these churches, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I have to be ready. I have to keep myself in a position to hear from God and do what God would have me to do. Hallelujah. Now, glory to God. Uh, we have to learn to be skillful with the things that God's placed in our lives. Not, not being skillful with the anointings upon your life. The Lord told a minister, a friend of mine, if you're not skillful with the, minister, the anointings that are upon your life, he said, uh, it will cause you to be out of the will of God. And when you're out of the will of God, you open the door for the devil to attack you. See, a lot of ministers, a lot of pastors, go down a direction that's not the will of God for them or for their ministry or for their organization, and they open the door up to the things of the enemy. Once you know this is what God told you to do, then you stay with what God told you. Don't be moved by what anyone else may be doing. All right? You do what God told you to do. So there are things that we're supposed to be skillful with. First of all, we have to be skillful with the anointing of the office that we stand in. Be skillful with that. When I knew that God had called me to pastor, I first of all went to the Word and learned everything I could about the office of the pastor. That's why I have such a love for the office. That's why I so magnify what God's called me to do. I believe that the office of the pastor comes behind no other office. All right? I believe it's that important. Now, uh, you know, there may be those that disagree with me, but that's fine. I'm magnifying my office. If you stand in another office, you should magnify your office and feel that what God has called you to do is the most important thing. But you have to be skillful with the office that you've been called to. Well, you know, part of being skillful is understanding what that office entails, understanding how to function and how to operate in it. It's not enough just to know that you're called the pastor. It's not enough just to know that there's that anointing on your life. How do I function in it? How do I operate in it? Once I can learn that and figure that out and begin to operate in that, now I'm being skillful with that. Now I'm being skillful in that area, all right? 
And then I've got to learn to be skillful with the, the endowments that have been placed within me. Uh, maybe you have a, a healing endowment that God's given you or a miracle working endowment. You've got to learn to be skillful with that so that you can function in the area that God told you to function in. Understand something, that when you and I finish our course, and every one of us should finish. I didn't say when you and I die. When we finish our course, there are people that die every day without finishing their course. All right? Just because you die doesn't mean you finished. When you and I finish our course, and we stand before the Lord Jesus, the Lord head of the church, it's not going to be a question of how big was your church, how large was your church. What I'll be rewarded on and rewarded for is that I did what he asked me to do with the church he gave me, with the ministry that he gave me. See, if you're a pastor in a church, helping in a church, God gave you that church, gave you as a gift to that church for you to make that church all that it can be in the kingdom of God. Whatever the size of your church is, pastor, you utilize every bit of that body to accomplish all that God's asked you to do. That's your job, is to get every bit of ability out of that church that I can to do what God's called us to do. No, no matter what it may be, when the Lord told us very early on to get the word out on every available voice, to get it out there every way that we could, because even in the city that we live in, this word of faith that we minister is not everywhere. All right? And, and I learned something. A minister said this, and it's so true. See, we're called to preach faith. If I don't preach faith, then my ministry becomes irrelevant. That's part of what I'm called to do. I have an anointing to preach faith, to preach the word of faith. The Lord told me, you preach the pure word of faith in the manner that you learned it. Now, here's the point. So when he began to ask us to get the word out on every available voice, that's what we begin to do. So we have podcasts, we have YouTube, we have Facebook Live, we have live stream, uh, we have, we're on two television networks, we have books that we publish, uh, CDs, anything basically techno technological that's out there that will allow us to get the word out, we're doing. What are we doing? Maximizing every bit of ability that we have. See, that's my job. My job is to go as far as I can where I'm at to do what God asked me to do. And consequently, we have seen the ability to upgrade We've seen the ability to upgrade our cameras. We've seen the ability to upgrade our equipment. And then you don't worry about, well, what am I going to do when I need to upgrade again? The same God that produced what you needed to get what you currently have will produce what you need to get what you're going to need. All right? This upgrade was a few thousand dollars more than the last upgrade. And the next upgrade will be more. How do I know that? Because Ron isn't cheap. <laughs> now, now, Ron's my technical guy, all right? He's our director, producer. But the point is, so he's not going to go and, and look for something cheap. And I don't want him to look for something cheap. But it's doing what God has called you to do. If Maybe it's God wants you to go on radio. Well, go on radio. If God told you to do it and will provide for it, then you maximize every bit of ability that you have. 
Well, but I can only go on one station. Then you go on that one station and you be faithful on that one station to preach the word of faith, to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to preach that God still saves and heals and delivers and sets free. And God will honor your commitment and your desire to maximize the abilities that you have. But if you sit around and you wait until you can go on 15 stations to step out and do something that the Lord's asking you to do, you'll never do it. Because you're not maximizing the ability that you have. Now, why is that a basic building block to success? Because that will follow you into every area of your ministry. That will follow you into every area. If you, if you will not maximize the abilities that you have, you'll never press yourself to get more from God, more revelation, deeper insight. It'll affect your study habits. It'll affect your leadership habits. Here's what will happen. Your leaders always become what you are. They always become what you are. Why? Because you can only impart what you are. And so if I become a very lackadaisical, if I become a very procrastinative, if I become a very uh, good enough is good enough in my mentality, and we don't need to press anymore, then I'm going to raise up leaders that are very lackadaisical, very procrastinating, very lackadaisical in what they, uh, uh, the way they approach things, and then nothing gets done. The reason why we have a staff that drives so hard in our churches is because my wife and I drive so hard. All right? Now, I'm going to get into this in just a moment about, about keeping that in the proper context. But, for instance, right now, Pastor Michelle, my wife, is driving back from Little Rock, having drove down yesterday to minister last night, and then got up early this morning to drive back. Now, understand, I'm not bragging. I don't want anybody to say, oh, praise. No, here's the point. That's why we have people that will go to the wall, if you will, to get done what needs to get done because that's in their DNA. Maximizing everything that you have. We're using every square inch of this building. All right? We're, we, we, we have made this small complex that we have here so versatile because we use every ounce, every inch of space, every inch in the sanctuary, every inch in the back sanctuary. Every room, there are rooms that offices are in and they were never meant to be offices. But yet they're there. Why? We're maximizing what God has given us. Well, why don't you just build a bigger building? God hadn't led me to do that yet. When he makes the way and gives me the go ahead, we'll do it. But I know it's got to be debt free because God won't let me go into debt. So what do I do? I maximize what we have. You maximize what you have. Hallelujah. Do you see that? Glory to God. Now, uh, let me say something about being ineffective. And uh, Pastor Happy Caldwell said this one time. He said, sin is not the primary thing that causes ministers to be ineffective. He said it's their involvement in the affairs of life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I know that we all have things in life that, that we're involved in, and, and, and I'm certainly not telling you that you shouldn't be involved in different things. It's when you become so involved that it begins to make you ineffective. Glory to God. When I'm so involved in things that I can't do what God wants me to do. All right? 
I was blessed to raise our children and none of them grew up and hated the ministry or despised the church. Uh, they may not have done everything I would have liked them to do, but that's one thing that they never did. All of them, all of them have a positive view of the church and, and attend church, but not necessarily my church, but they, they attend church, my son and his wife with their families. Uh, my youngest son and his wife pastor a church in uh, uh, Illinois. Uh, my oldest daughter does attend church. But here's the point that I'm making. How did I be a father and yet do what God asked me to do? Because it was very well known, number one, in our home that we're going to do what God has asked us to do. And there's going to be things that I miss to be able to do what God's called me to do, but at the same time, with good proper planning, I could still be involved in everything they were doing and still do what God was asking of us. There are ministers that get so involved in those everyday things of life, even their family issues, that they become ineffective. You've got to compartmentalize and put what God has asked you to do at the top of the list. You know, there, 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 may, be some, there may be some things that you miss. You may not make every music recital. But you may not, you don't have to miss them all either. But you may not make them all. Well, what do you have to do? You've got to set that child down and say, look, I've, I, I've got to go do this, and I'll be at the next one. Now, that sounds like a simple thing. But when you hear all the stories about ministers' marriages breaking up and their families falling apart, and then they go back and they blame the ministry. We were traveling so much. We were doing this. We were doing that. No, that's a lack of planning. That's a lack of diligence on their part of putting a proper emphasis on their lives. That's how it is. My wife and I are as apart from each other every week. We are apart from each other as much or more than any other ministry couple that I know. But we've learned... The key, we've learned the secret. Number one, it's not hard. All right? Number two, we don't talk all the time about how much we miss each other, how bad we miss each other. Do I miss her? Of course, she's my best friend. She's part of me. But if we do say we miss each other, it's I miss your presence. But I don't miss you in a sorrowful way. So you've got to settle these things. You've got to settle them. Because the ministry will never destroy your marriage. The ministry will never destroy your family. It's not the ministry that destroys family. It's not the ministry that destroys marriages. It's a lack of emphasis on the minister's part. You, you can't just have the emphasis that you want to be the best minister you can be and be so successful in, in ministry that you forget that your first ministry is to your wife and your children. Well, how can I do everything God's called me to do and still be everything I need to be to them? Well, God knew that you were going to be in ministry and he knew that you were going to have a wife and kids. Hello? Hello? He knew that. And so he will give you the wisdom to do it. But you'll become ineffective when you get out of balance. I can be ineffective in my ministry by going too much after just ministry, just everything's ministry. I don't have time for anything else. I become ineffective. Why? Because my marriage is hurting. My family's hurting. I'm not being the example I need to be to the flock. I can become ineffective in my ministry 
going too far the other way. I'm going to be at everything. I'm, 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 I'm going to be at every soccer game, every recital, everything that's going on. I'm never going to miss anything. Well, you might miss something. Now, there have been times that, that I've left my wife to minister. One time I left her to minister on a Wednesday because I had not been at one of my son's wrestling matches. And they were wrestling here in town. And, and I went on a Wednesday night to the wrestling match. Now, they're, they're, they're the high school wrestling match. There are people who say, well, I cannot believe that you, you, you left church to go watch your son in a wrestling match. Well, it's, it's called balance. I, I knew the church was well taken care of. Now, I can only think of maybe one time that I did that. Every other time I was able to plan. The only other time I missed service for an event was when my oldest daughter graduated from high school. It was on a Sunday night. What would you do? I left the church with my associate and went to my daughter's graduation. See, it's called balance. I was not going to let an event like that that was very vital to her, very important, all right? I was not going to look at her and say, I can't come because I've got a minister. I don't, I don't miss church. I'm not out of my pulpit on a regular basis. So I knew it wasn't going to hurt anything. Do you see the balance aspect of it? I'm trying to get you to see the balance. You, you keep it in balance. But also... For your family to understand, they have to understand this is what you do. Ministry, day in and day out, is my job. It's what I do. I, I know ministers that are in what they call full-time ministry, but it's really full-time recliner seating other than when they're preaching, sitting other than when they're preaching. And their family comes home, their kids come home, and they're in the recliner in the morning when they leave for school and in the recliner when they get home at night. And the children never see ministry as an occupation. They see ministry as preaching. That's why we have office hours, not just my staff. I have office hours because this is our job. This is what we do. You don't become entangled. You're not in full-time ministry to hang out Monday through Friday during the day and do whatever you want to do and go hang out at the coffee shop and do nothing all day where your church is concerned and call yourself full-time ministry. You're taking a check for nothing. You're a hireling if you're doing that. They don't pay me to preach. I'm called to preach. You can't put a payment on that. I receive a salary for being the president and the CEO of Faith Builders International Incorporated. I receive a, a check and I'm, I receive a salary for that, not for preaching. Settle that. See, this is, this is how you stop from becoming involved in the affairs of life to the point that it renders you ineffective. I believe I'm helping you. Amen. You, you don't want to be one of those preachers that claims to be in full-time ministry, but yet you're not ministering full-time. That won't work. I, I knew a minister one time that was in full-time ministry, but never went into the office. Well, he had a very high turnover rate in his office. He was constantly having to put out little fires in his church. Why? He was never in the office. He was never there on the ground with the troops. I, I, I think that's so important. And, and I've never been in the military. Uh, ne never, obviously, the, 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 never had the, the, the opportunity but here's the point. I've, I've read a lot about the actions of the military. And in my mind, from what I see, the greatest leaders are those that are on the ground with the troops and know what's going on. You've got you've to have your finger on the pulse 
of your ministry every day. Every day. Why? Because that's what God has called me to do. That's what God has called me to be. I know ministers that, that uh, talk about being in full-time ministry and being full-time pastors, and they never, they, they never do anything but minister Sunday and Wednesday. That's getting out of balance. It just is. And the temptation is this. Because you're the leader, because you're the one that God has called and anointed to lead that organization, you know, I have a very capable staff. And there have been times that I've called and said I'm going to be late. There have been times I've called and even said I'm not going to be in today. I need to take care of this or, or maybe I haven't seen my wife for a few days. I'm going to spend time with her or uh, our grandson's coming over. I'm going to be in a few hours late because I'm going to spend time with him. And, but here's the thing. And immediately the response is, yes, sir, pastor, we'll see you when you get here. Well, here's the thing. If you're not careful, because you can do that, it becomes very easy to do. You've got to discipline yourself to do every day what you're supposed to do so that you don't become ineffective. Don't get so involved in the affairs of this life that you become ineffective at what God's called you to do. Right on the other hand, don't run yourself ragged doing what God's called you to do and become ineffective in your family. There's a balance. Am I helping you? Now, hallelujah. Remember that what God has called you to do is what God has called you to do. Now, I know a lot of ministers that when they're doing what God has asked them, uh, they almost allow people to feel sorry for them and, and you know, oh, I, you know, you're doing so much for the Lord and, and, and oh, that must be tough and that must... No, li listen, listen, I'm only doing what the Lord asked me to do. I'm just doing what God asked me to do. In Luke chapter 17 and verse 10, Jesus said, even so on your part, when you've done everything that was assigned and commanded you, say, we are unworthy servants, possessing no merit, for we've not gone beyond our obligation. We have merely done what was our duty to do. We've merely done what was our duty to do to do. What you and I are doing for the Lord doesn't need any special recognition. We're simply doing what's our duty to do. So what we're doing. We don't need or require praise or thanks. We're just doing what God told us to do. Now people will say everybody likes a pat on the back and a thank you. Yes, that, that's true. And we try to do that. But why are you doing what God told you to do? See, we're talking about being successful. Why are you doing what God told you to do? Because everybody's going to appreciate it or recognize it or pat you on the back? That's not always going to happen. But here's the thing. I don't require that. And I can even say this, I'm just doing what I'm doing for the Lord. I'm doing it for Him. So I don't deserve praise or thanks because I'm doing it for the Lord. Uh, understand what I mean by that. I don't mean that, that if somebody says, we're sure grateful for what you're doing, that you say, oh, don't say that to me. I don't deserve that. No, that's, that's a wrong mindset. What I mean is if I'm just doing it for the Lord, then I don't have the mindset of, boy, I deserve somebody to tell me thank you. I run into so, minister, so many ministers. Oh, ministry is such a thankless job. Well, what did you think? I mean, what, what did you think was going to happen 
when you started dealing in the ministry with people. There's not one scripture in the Bible that says everybody's going to be thankful for you. But there are scriptures in the word of God that says God is thankful for what you're doing. That God is grateful for what you're doing. See, you've got to be very careful with that. Because when I get to that area where I need special recognition or I need somebody to tell me what a good job I'm doing, then I'm beginning to see what motivates me. What should motivate us is that we're doing what God asks us to do. This is what the Lord asks of me. Now, is there effort involved? Yes, there is. There's effort involved. Can it be tiring effort? Yes, it can be. But it's still what God asked me to do. So, the price is not greater than the reward. I don't need the recognition of people. I just need to do what God's asked me to do. And the Lord said that to me one time. He said, you're just doing what I ask you to do. In other words, if God says, I need you to pastor a church in another location, in another state, okay, it's not any big thing. Oh, but that drive, I just don't know how you handle that drive. It's not any big thing. Here's how you handle the drive. You get in the car and you go there. You get back in the car and you come back. Amen. Because if you don't keep that mindset, see, whether anybody thanks you or not, you're still called to do what you're doing. And I'll run into ministry, these ungrateful people, these unthankful people. Now, but wait a minute, hang on, your spirit's wrong. His spirit is wrong. Because I'm not doing it for the thanks of people. I'm not doing it for the glory of men. I'm not doing it for the praise of individuals. I'm doing it because God asked me to do it. And that's how you get over into really helping people is when regardless of their attitude, you are staying committed to what God asks you and then God will honor you God will provide and, and produce ways to make easier what you're doing. Because I'm doing this for him. I've, I've watched over the years how things have gotten much easier, much more comfortable for my wife and I. For instance, we're, we're at the point in our ministry now where if we wanted to, we could fly everywhere we go via the airlines, not through our own plane yet. It's coming. But we could fly everywhere we go. We wouldn't have to drive. But here's what we've learned is it's really not that much faster and it's really not that much more relaxing. It takes the same amount of time to fly from here to Little Rock as it does to drive. It's five and a half, six hours either way. But here's my point. If we wanted to fly, we could. Why? God's blessed us. Why? We've been faithful. When we go somewhere and we, and we have to stay in a town, we can stay in a nice place. We, we don't have to stay in them where they leave the light on for you anymore. Now, you may, you may be staying there. Be faithful. The Bible says a faithful man will abound with blessings. And don't complain about having to stay in the cheaper room. Don't complain when you have to drive somewhere. I have driven places and paid my way to preach and didn't get anything in return. It's being faithful with what God asked you to do. And people then will look at your life as God begins to bless you and as God begins to bless your ministry and, and they want to know how you did it 
and they want the shortcut, and then when you say it's just being faithful, oh. Faithfulness has no time limit. You're faithful, period. The people that God's called me to, I'm faithful to them, not for a season, I'm faithful to them, period. Loyalty is so huge in the life of a minister. You've got to be loyal to the fathers that God brought into your life. You've got to be loyal to the people that God has called to help you. You've got to be loyal to the people that God has called you to minister to. You think the best of every one of those people. You think the best of your staff. You think the best of the fathers and the faith that God's called into your life. Why? That's being faithful to them. That's being faithful to them. And as you're faithful, without worry about recognition. One time, I'll, I'll end with this. One time I was with... Uh, uh, one of my fathers in the faith. And, uh, well, I'll tell you, I was with Pastor Caldwell. I was at a meeting with him. And I called him one morning to ask him a question. I was helping him, and, and I called him to ask him a question. And uh, he answered my question. And then he said this to me. He said, uh, and uh, why don't you just sit with us today? Well, I'm not a, a presumptive person. And, and here's the thing. Uh, he was one of the speakers in the meeting sitting on the front row. Well, one just doesn't decide they're going to sit on the front row. All right? But this is what he had asked me to do. Well, I knew uh, an individual, uh, the, actually the, the, uh, the head person over that conference, and I went to them and I said, Pastor Caldwell wants me to sit with him. And, he, and, of course, it was no problem. Now, here's the point that I'm making. All the years that I've been doing what I'm doing, and, and even so far as helping them, never one time, never, never one time have I ever asked for a special place to sit. As a matter of fact, I was at a conference, and, and I always introduce his product for him. And I make myself available. And I, I came in from the media table and I just went and sat down towards the back. And one of the, the, the uh, family members that, of the leaders of the conference said, do you need a special seat? And I said, no, I, you know, I'm fine. I'll just, I, I know uh, when he's going to ask and I'll just be there and be ready. Well, it was about five minutes later, a person tapped me on the shoulder and said, they've asked me to move you to the front up here about the second row. Well, that's wonderful, but here's my point that I'm making to you. I never ask for that. I'm just being faithful. Well, this conference that I'm talking about, as I sat down on the front row next to him. Now, I've sat on the front row next to him before, but as I sat on the front row in this conference, this whole concept of faithfulness just really began to fly in my spirit. I'm not there to get a pat on the back. I'm not there for someone to see me. I'm there to be faithful. You know, you can be faithful sitting in the overflow room. You can be faithful doing the menial job that nobody else wants to do. But you're faithful doing it. What will happen? One day, they'll take you to the proverbial front row. And there'll be people sitting in that group that will think, well, who's he? Who's she? And the call from heaven will come out, they're a faithful person. Doesn't matter what your name is. Be found faithful. Praise God. Well, I believe I've helped you today, and I believe that God is going to move in your ministry and in your life. Please uh, be aware and know. Now, next weekend, uh, we have beginning next Friday, we have beginning our uh, Friday evening, our faith explosion. Pastor Michelle will be ministering Friday evening. Uh, 
I will be ministering Saturday evening. Pastor Larry Price will be ministering Saturday morning. Pastor Marie Price will be ministering uh, Saturday morning as well as Pastor Tony Mendez. And then on Sunday morning and Sunday night, we have Pastor Happy Caldwell with us and Miss Jeannie Caldwell. And we're going to believe God that God's going to do some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things in that meeting. So log on. All the services will be live streamed. You can see what God's doing here at Faith Builders International in DeSoto, Kansas. I'm so glad that you invited me into your home, into your workplace today. And I believe that as you put these principles to work, that God will bless and honor your ministry in the name of Jesus. Until next month at this same time, listen, I want to remind you, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the word of God. God bless you.